Do you know what the realm is? It's the thousand blades of Aegon's enemies. A story we agree to tell each other over and over till we forget that it's a lie. But what do we have left once we abandon the lie? Chaos. A gaping pit waiting to swallow us all. Chaos isn't a pit. Chaos is a ladder. Back in the Bone Nars episode, we briefly touched on the hierarchy of the Wolf Pack and how it applies to the Garu Nation. The Silver Fangs are the Alphas, and the Bone Nars are the Omegas, but an Alpha has to have its Beta to keep the others in line. That is where the Shadow Lords come in. They are the Betas to the Silver Fangs Alphas. They're the tribe in the Garu Nation with very few qualms about what they do. Why do they do it though? None of the tribes have any trouble with getting the blood of their enemies on their claws but only one is willing to stain their claws with the blood of not just their enemies, but their allies too. The Garu that became the Shadow Lords originally settled in Asia. They found the best way to control humans was indirectly through human dynasties, but making themselves valuable to said dynasties. Their guile and cunning attracted the attention of the spirit that would become their tribal totem, Grandfather Thunder. Grandfather Thunder was inspired by the tribe's might and ruthlessness, and offered them his power in exchange for their loyalty. They accepted and became the Shadow Lords. During the Impergium, the Shadow Lords forged an alliance with the Silver Fangs. While the Fangs led from the front, the Lords would be the one to do the more unsavory tasks. They would willingly dirty their hands so the Fangs could remain pure, or at least maintain their image of purity. The Lords were happy to do it because they kept the unity of the Garu strong. Where the War of Rage is concerned, the Shadow Lords said that what happened was that in their pride they drove the other Pharaoh to spite them. While they accepted their culpability, they believed that what befell the Pharaoh tribes was their own fault for provoking the Garu. If you bait a bear and it mauls you, it's your own damn fault, they say. When the Garu decided to call for an end to the Impergium, the Shadow Lords reluctantly agreed because the humans had grown too powerful. It was a decision the Lords came to regret because they had allowed sentimentality for humans to cloud their judgment. As the centuries came and went, the Lords continued to keep eyes on humanity, watching various empires rise and fall. With the rise of Rome, the Lords' skill at manipulation and intrigue would be elevated to a high art. Now before anyone asks, no. The Shadow Lords had no hand in any Roman emperors whatsoever, mainly because they had no interest in them. Now the Senators, those caught their eye. Now make no mistake, the Romans were not Shadow Lord kin. Their kin were the barbarian tribes in the north, more specifically the tribes that would become the people known as the Slavs. The only reason the Lords paid any attention to Rome was for its politicking and warmongering. They paid close attention to what the Romans did and learned a great deal from them. Unfortunately, they were not able to control Rome as easily as they liked. The Empire had expanded too far and the kin folk they employed as middlemen were not efficient enough at gaining them a foothold in Rome. But by the 6th century, the Lords saw the right on the wall and decided that it was time to bring the Roman Empire down. Vandals, Visigoths, and many other tribes all had Shadow Lord kinfolk among their numbers, and they would lay the foundation for many of the European nations we see today. But following the fall of Rome, the Empire was split into two empires, one to the west and one to the east. And it was in the east that one of the greatest Shadow Lord kinfolk would come to power, Emperor Justinian of the Byzantine Empire. With the Byzantine Empire being so close to the Visigoth homelands, it was easily accessible to the Shadow Lords and they enjoyed the power they wielded within it. Sadly though, vampires living within the Empire would cause it to fall apart and when it did, the bloodsuckers retreated to the Balkans. Now, I would go into more detail at this point, but a lot of what falls for the Shadow Lords history can basically be summed up like this. We watch slash help Empire rise, and then later it falls. The Arab Kingdoms in North Africa, the Charlemagne Empire, the Ottomans, the Crusades, the Mongols, if you can name a powerful empire in history, chances are the Shadow Lords were involved in some capacity. Although an interesting turn happened with their kin out in Wallachia, located in modern-day Romania. Yes, this is going exactly where you think it is. Vlad the Impaler had waged a bloody campaign across his homeland against the Turks, 
and it caught the eye of vampires. So he was quickly embraced and made one of them. While the lords weren't exactly thrilled about throwing their lot in with a bloodsucker, Vlad was at least protecting their kin, so they saw him as the lesser of two evils. At the time, at least. It didn't take long for Vlad's cruelty to become indiscriminate, which ultimately led to him being ousted from power, and Wallachia being made a vassal state of the Ottoman Empire. Not ideal for the Shadow Lords, but the Turks were at least better than Vlad, though that was damning with faint praise. During the Renaissance, the Lord's grip on humanity began to weaken. Gunpowder was imported to Europe from China, movable print was being distributed amongst the masses, and the compass allowed Europeans to explore lands far beyond the seas. It was during this time Spanish Shadow Lords waged what came to be known as the Second War of Rage. The Shadow Lords saw the cruelty and depravity of the human tribes like the Tolmecs, Aztecs, and especially the Mayans, and coupled with the local pharaoh's utter indifference, the Shadow Lords began a bloody campaign across South America where they utterly devastated the human and pharaoh tribes in equal measure. One fair tribe they completely destroyed were the Kamazots, the Werebats. Believe it or not, when the last Kamazots died at the claws of a lord named Dark Claws of Vengeance, the Shadow Lords were utterly devastated because they had brought the end of an entire species and one of Gaia's chosen, no less. That guilt still weighs heavy on them to this day. As the years went on, the Shadow Lords watched as the Ottoman stranglehold on the Balkans weakened and their kin's own nations rise up and forming their own identities only later to be dragged into the senseless carnage of World War I, and then watched in horror as Germany ran roughshod across Europe in World War II, only for the Soviet Union to absorb the whole of Eastern Europe into the USSR afterward. In fact, during the Cold War, the Shadow Lords found themselves in key positions of influence in both the USA and the USSR. Meaning yes, CIA and KGB werewolves were a thing. Of course, as we all know, the Soviet Union began to crack apart in the 80s, and needless to say, the Lords, they were not thrilled about it. While the Shadow Lords didn't like the Soviets, they at least did a good job maintaining order and a sort of peace. At least under them, they were able to protect their kinfolk more efficiently, and that was lost when the Iron Curtain fell. The Soviets, for all their faults, kept the vampires under their boots, but with them gone, Eastern Europe quickly turned into a war zone, especially when the legendary Nosferatu vampire Baba Yaga came to ravage their lands. You might think the Shallers might have stepped up to do something about her, right? No. They were too caught up in their own internal politicking to be bothered to do anything about Baba Yaga, and it took other vampires to ultimately put her down. The upside was it freed the former Soviet territories up for the Shadow Lords' taking, but that came at the cost of order. The reason they tolerated the Soviets was because they knew what to expect under them. But with the power vacuum left behind came mass chaos and civil war raged across Eastern Europe. It was in one of these former Soviet territories that a great Shadow Lord would rise to power. Yugoslavia had been ravaged by civil war and the Wormbanes feasting on the terror and violence. But as the dust began to settle, the Shadow Lords managed to carve out territory in the north while the Black Furies did the same in the south. There was an uneasy peace between them, but Margrave Yuri Konetsko of the Shadow Lords managed to put a stop to that and is now why the Shadow Lords enjoy a cozy working relationship with the Furies. Meanwhile, over in Mexico, a Shadow Lord named Miguel Gutierrez, a descendant of Dark Claws of Vengeance, had been on a quest learning what he could about the Camazots and their totem bat. His quest would ultimately take his pack to the depths of the Malfis, the realm of the Worm, where they found Bat completely corrupted by the Worm, or so they thought. The spirit of Dark Claws of Vengeance managed to reach the small part of Bat that hadn't been consumed by hate, and Miguel found a way to communicate with it. His pack would take on that aspect of Bat as their totem. It seemed like madness taking on a worm totem, but Gutierrez's pack showed no signs of the worm's taint, and so now, that is part of Grandfather Thunder's brood to this day. Now, the Shadow Lords dominate across Europe, in no small part due to the efforts of Margrave Yuri Konetsko. He took the Gyaru and Valachia and made them into a mighty army that drove the vampires out and has managed to make connections with Anatoly Marashik, the Sep leader of the Thunderstrike Sept in Russia, which gives him a great deal of clout within that territory. If anyone can rise to challenge Jonas Albrecht, the last guy in King himself for dominance, it is the Margrave. The only question is, how long does he plan to wait to make his move? The Shadow Lords are a tribe that value guile, cunning, and ruthlessness. While plenty of the Lords are accomplished warriors in their own right, the tribe prefers to exercise brain over brawn. As long as the Shadow Lords can maintain power and authority, the methods are irrelevant. It also means Shadow Lords will not hesitate to cut down their opponents without a second thought. There's no room for mercy in the game they play. The Shadow Lords also have a nasty reputation for the unsavory methods they employ. But of course, 
They have their own justifications for that. From behind the scenes, the Shadow Lords pull their strings and move people around like pawns in their games. Because of this, the Shadow Lords are one of the least trusted tribes in the Galru Nation. Basically, the bigger a Shadow Lord is smiling, the sharper his claws are. One of their camps, the Judges of Doom, is feared throughout the Galru Nation, said to have eyes and ears everywhere to see that the Litany is obeyed above all things. If a Judge is sent to hunt you down, your death is guaranteed. It's only a question of when. The Shadow Lord Totem is Grandfather Thunder, a totem that commands both fear and respect in equal measure. Grandfather Thunder is a harsh taskmaster, and always asks a great deal of sacrifice from those in the tribe, but those who earn his respect gain much in the way of power. He is a spirit that holds both life and death in his hands. Just as his reigns bring destruction upon the guilty and innocent alike, so too do they wash away corruption and decay, so that life may begin anew. It also must be said that when a Shadow Lord takes on Grandfather Thunder as his totem, he must swear to keep secrets, as failing to do so carries great punishment with it. Where breeds are concerned, Lupus are few within the tribe but command a great deal of respect and influence. Even Konietzko respects the Lupus and the Shadow Lords. They are sought by the tribe for their wisdom and counsel. The Hamids make up the majority of the tribe. In contrast to the Lupus, they are more interested in the tribe's politicking and scheming, so more often than not, they're the ones calling the shots. Metas are not looked upon favorably within the tribe, but their familiarity with Gauru society gives them an edge over the other breeds. A Shadow Lord Metas typically walks with a chip on his shoulder, but that resentment gives him the drive to one-up his tribesmen. Luckily, thanks to the Margrave, it seems that the tribe's attitudes towards Metas are changing for the better. The Shadow Lord's territory is largely in Eastern Europe, with their most notable Cairns residing in Ukraine, Russia, and Romania, so the majority of their kinfolk are Slavic. Though Shadow Lords are not picky about ethnicity, Shadow Lords can come from any stock. The only thing that matters is that you have the cunning and ruthlessness to be a Shadow Lord. Playing a Shadow Lord requires you to play a character who has no qualms about sacrificing fellow Garou and humans. Shadow Lords live by ends justify the means to the nth degree. A Shadow Lord's greatest weapon will always be his cunning. He will be the type to use deception to win. A good Shadow Lord should be a good strategist, always thinking five steps ahead of his pack and enemies. Here's an analogy. Imagine you are in a dark room. Then the light comes and all is revealed. That is what it means to play a Shadow Lord. Keep others in the dark and only reveal once the time is right. So my ideal Shadow Lord is the chess master. His plans have wheels within wheels. His own allies don't know what he's thinking. And even they aren't certain how much they can trust him. The only thing they know for certain is that for now his claws aren't aimed at them. So taking into that account, here are several characters that work for inspiration. Well, starting off, Walter White and Gus Fring from Breaking Bad. If you've seen Breaking Bad, then you remember this cat and mouse game. You remember the lengths that both Walter and Gus were willing to go to in order to one-up each other. Next up, Frank Underwood from House of Cards. Frank Underwood is the stereotypical scheming politician taken to the nth degree. The guy desires to be president and he's willing to step on anyone to accomplish that. Lex Luthor. I don't think much needs to be said. Everyone knows Lex. Next up, Shane Walsh from The Walking Dead. He's always trying to test and best Rick as he is the ideal beta male. And his ways, though different and much more controversial, are just as effective as Rick's as well. Next up, Lord Varys, Littlefinger, and the Lannisters from Game of Thrones. I honestly don't think I need to go into this too much. Everyone knows how well Varys and Littlefinger are playing the Game of Thrones and, and the kind of schemers the Lannisters are, especially Tywin. Next up, a personal favorite of mine, Garrick from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Garrick is about as much of a Shadow Lord as you can get. He's an Obsidian Order agent, and in fact, the Obsidian Order is basically the judges of doom for the Cardassians. They have eyes and ears everywhere. And Garrick is also willing to kill his own people if it means it's for the good of Cardassia. I can best sum up how much of a Shadow Lord Garrick is from this one line he has in the episode Tacking to the Wind. You're still a Cardassian, Garrick. You're not going to kill one of your own people for a Pajoran woman. How little you understand me. David Xanatos from Gargoyles. Anyone who's seen Gargoyles remembers just how much of a schemer this guy was, how he always seemed to be one step ahead of everyone, and how he always seemed to know exactly what they were going to do. Griffith from Berserk. The Golden Age arc just showed how cunning and ruthless Griffith would be. This guy was going to have his own kingdom, and he was not going to let anyone stand in his way. Rachel Ghoul. The guy works from the shadows and has no qualms about killing innocent people 
if it means restoring the Earth's natural beauty. The Punisher. How much have I got to say? This guy hunts down criminals and will massacre them in totality. And while we're on that subject, Shadow also fits that as well. <laughs> What evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the shadow knows. In fact, this guy was basically the pulp version of the Punisher. And I'm finally going to end this on Judge Dredd. After all, the judges in Judge Dredd, they are judge, jury, and executioner all rolled into one. The Shadow Lords are regarded among the Garo Nation with suspicion and mistrust. Their history is no doubt a bloody one, but they did it because no one else would. The Silver Fangs had to remain noble, the Get Offenders rely too much on brute force, and the Red Talons lack vision. They've always been the ones doing what was necessary, whether that meant sacrificing one Garo or a thousand humans, whatever it takes to see Guy's will done. And now, with the weakness the Fangs are beginning to show, the Lords are beginning to think, it's time for a new Alpha to ascend. I don't think they won't do it. Their claws are already stained with the blood of man, wolf, and worm. What's a little more Gauru blood to them? Here we come, the army of the night.